Welcome everyone to this afternoon's applied session. Just to give you all a brief introduction about myself, my name is Ishani and I'm currently a PhD candidate at Deakin Health Economics, Melbourne. We have with us today Assistant Professor Marzia Sultano Kotabi, who will be presenting on machine learning methods in HEOR. Dr. Marzia is an Assistant Professor in Industrial and Systems Engineering. Her research interests include mathematical modeling and game theoretic approaches to healthcare and socioeconomic systems. The primary focus of her research is on modeling the behavioral response of individuals and populations to epidemics using evolutionary game theory and machine learning to optimize the set of public health policies in controlling the epidemics. Dr. Marzia received a PhD from Kansas State University in industrial engineering. She also holds a master's degree in socioeconomic systems engineering. Now, before we begin, we would like to remind all the attendees with us today to use the Zoom's built-in chat function to ask any questions that you have regarding the presentation. Clara, another committee member, will moderate all the questions at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, I welcome Dr. Marzia to share their screen and begin the presentation. Well, thank you so much, Ishani. Uh, and um, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. So, uh, give me a second to share my screen and I will start my presentation. Okay, uh, well, today I want to talk about uh, applications of machine learning models in health economics. And uh, I want to specifically focus on the applications of machine learning in containing epidemics, epidemics such as COVID-19. Uh, well, uh, Ishani has a, a very nice introduction. Uh, but let me talk about the type of research that I uh, work on. Uh, as she said, I'm an assistant professor of industrial and systems engineering at the University of New Haven. And uh, I'm very interested in solving problems related to healthcare and socioeconomic system. And uh, the methods that I use to solve these problems are mainly game theoretic models, uh, mathematical models, uh, I use data-driven models, and also net network theory. So a combination of these models uh, to see how we can help health systems to work more efficiently. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, three projects. One of them is the one that I'm going to talk about in this presentation, uh, modeling uh, and optimization of uh, epidemic containment policies. I also work on uh, two other projects with, with my students. Uh, the first one is modeling the whole genomic sequencing implementation. And we use system dynamics models and also game theoretic models uh, to find out uh, what is the best scenario to implement uh, WGS uh, to treat cancer. Uh, I also work on one other project, which is uh, about uh, finding the best locations for the limited uh, health centers that we may have available at times similar to COVID-19. Uh, and uh, at a time that we have some groups of individuals who are uh, in more need of uh, ac having access to such facilities, such as uh, people uh, who are in like 60s and uh, in in higher ages oh uh, well with this introduction let's go to the uh, presentation and talk about epidemics uh okay i think after covid 19 we are well aware of the large public health costs of epidemics uh we know that uh, infectious diseases can cause mortality they can cause uh, severe morbidity. And also in the world that we live in, globalization has increased the chance of infection in different societies. So if there is an infectious disease in one, one part of the world, there is a very high probability that we can see that, that infectious disease in other places. And also when we face epidemics, we may see different behaviors. And these behaviors can make controlling the, the epidemics even harder. Well, when we face any epidemics, uh, we have uh, an approach to 
control the, the epidemic. Let's see what is this approach. So the first thing that we do in any epidemic is to monitor the epidemic, to get some data about the epidemic. So what is the number of infection? What is the transmission rate of the disease? So how this disease can be transmitted? So we get all of this information. And with this information, we can have a state of the pandemic. And then we can use this information to build models uh, to predict the future state of the pandemic. So what will be the number of infected individuals in the future? What, will, what, are, what is our expectation uh, of the death rate? And all these things. And then we use these prediction models to make decisions. So we want to see what is the best strategy? What should we do? What is the uh, result of applying one strategy in controlling the epidemics? So we know this approach as a 3M approach. So we monitor, model, and we make decisions. And we know that when we model epidemics, and if we have a good model, then we can help public health policymakers to make better decisions in controlling the epidemics. Okay. Uh, when we face the epidemics and we want to build a model, one of the first thing that we need to do is decide about the model, is to decide about the model that we want to use based on the type of the infectious diseases that we work with. So if we have a disease such that we have a susceptible person, that person can become infected with some probability, some rate. And after recovery, that person is susceptible again. We know these types of models as SIS. Uh, I believe that anyone who had some uh, study in this area is uh, familiar with these uh, models that I'm talking about now. Uh, so we have SIS model. We may have SIR model. These are two basic models. So we have a susceptible individual. The person can become infected with some rate. And after some time, the person will become recovered. And this person is immune to the disease. It's not susceptible anymore. And there is another model, SIR, which is very similar to SIR, and it is mainly used in modeling COVID-19. Uh, and the model like worked like this. So we have a susceptible individual. That person may become exposed to the, to the infectious disease. And if the person shows symptoms, that person is in the infected status. Uh, after some time, the person will become recovered and the person is not susceptible to the disease again. Let's say that we are talking just about one variant of the disease. And there are some group of, groups of individuals who doesn't show any symptom. And after some time, they are recovered, but are still uh, immune and they cannot be become infected anymore. Oh, uh, but in this presentation, I'm going to use a very simple model, SIR. And uh, there is one thing that I want to consider, which is the behavior of the individuals. So I want to consider a state, which is a vaccinated state, or let's say that the people who use preventive techniques. And those people, let's assume that they cannot be infected for simplicity. But we talked about the model that we use to show the type of the diseases that we work with. Uh, when we build any epidemiological model, we may consider the population that we work with in different forms. For example, we may have a compartmental models in which we have a population and we divide the population to several groups. So for example, we may have susceptible individuals, which are pur purple, we may have infected individuals, which are uh, yellow, and we may have recovered individuals, which are red. And just one thing, I'm going to use the same color coding through the end of this presentation. So uh, it's good if you remember the colors. Uh, but, so in some models, we have a population and we just uh, calculate the change in the number uh, of each group in the population. 
in some of the models that we know as special models, we consider the network of interactions between individuals. So we have different individuals as nodes of the network. And if there's an edge between these two individuals, it means that they are interacting with each other. So there is a possibility of, the, of infection to be transmitted through this interaction. And we also see some computer-based models in which we have different agents. So they can go to home, they can go to hospital, to work. And in each place, there is a chance of meeting someone who is infected. OK. Uh, so I talked about the model that we use to show the type of the disease. I also talked about the model that we use to show the type of the population that we work with to show the dynamic of the epidemics. Now let's talk a little about machine learning models. Well, uh, in machine learning models, uh, I want to start with some definitions so you are familiar. Uh, if you are not familiar with machine, machine learning models, you, you get an idea of different types of the models that we have. And then I will show the applications in COVID-19. So in machine learning models, we usually have three classes of models. Uh, one is supervised learning. The other one is unsupervised learning. And uh, we also have reinforcement learning models. Let's start with the supervised learning model. In supervised learning model, we have two very famous uh, type of models, the models that we use for classification and the ones that we use for regression. Let's go to the classification. And let me tell you that one of the most important thing about supervised learning models is that the data that we give to our model is labeled, okay? Uh, let me show it to you in the classification example that I have. So let's assume that I have a data uh, of uh, some emails, and I also have a label for the email. So if the email is a spam or not, and I give my model uh, this data, I train my model, and at the end, my model can decide uh, if I give it a, an email, my model can decide if it's a it's if it's a spam or not. Okay, so we have classification uh, based on the, the features of the email, based on the words in the email, the model will learn to classify the emails to a spam and not a spam. So now if I give the model an email which was not in the training data, the model can decide if, the, if we have a spam uh, email or not. Regression is mainly used for prediction. So let's say that I have the data of some houses. So I have different features. For example, I have the square feet. I have uh, the age of the house. Uh, I have the location of the house. And let's say many different features. One of the beauty of machine learning models is that you can use many different uh, features uh, in your model and the model uh, has the capacity of considering different features. So let's say that I give all of this data about the house and I also give the price of the house to my model for training. So I have a bunch of data about the features of the house and also, also the price of the house. And when I train my model, uh, the model can decide if I give it a house with different uh, features, the model can decide what is the price of the house, okay? The model can predict based on the information and what uh, the model has learned. Okay, so these are about supervised learning. So you see that in both of them, the data was labeled. I had some features and I also had a label, for example, a spam, not a spam, the price is also a label. In unsupervised learning, and the main class that we have here is clustering, we don't have any label. So we have different data. We have, uh, for example, one of the applications of uh, this clustering is in clustering the customers 
so we have different char characteristics of customers. And then using clustering, we can put these customers in different clusters. Okay, so you see, I didn't have any data. I just have some features, some characteristics. And then I can make some cl clusters and I can show that, well, these with these characteristics, they, they are similar to each other. They are close to each other. So maybe they belong to one cluster. And the last one that I have is reinforce, reinforcement learning. So what is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is a little different from the uh, others that I have. In the reinforcement learning, I have an agent. The agent interacts with the uh, environment. So uh, the agent is an, in, a, in a state. Uh, it takes an action. And as a result of that interaction, that, act, that action, the agent receives a reward from the environment. And based on this data that the agent receives, after a while, the model will learn what is the best action. What are the actions that um, give that uh, agent the maximum reward? So it's very similar to training a dog. So uh, the dog has an action, you give them treat or not. And uh, then the, the dog learns. So if the dog sits, you will, the dog will uh, get, a, uh, get a trip. Okay, so let's see how we can use these different models that we have here in COVID-19 and how these models are used uh, in COVID-19. Uh, let me start with classification. So there are lots of different uh, models, uh, machine learning models which are used um, to classify uh, the COVID-19 COVID patients based on the uh, chest X-ray image. So we give the X-ray image of different individuals to our model, and then we have a label if that person has COVID-19 or not. We give the model several images uh, and after a while the model will learn that uh, to, to give a label to a, an x-ray an image so if a, if the x-ray the, the individual who has that x-ray image is uh, infected with covid19 or not and there are also some models uh, which use different features uh, and they decide, whether a patient will have a severe uh, COVID-19 or not. For example, they get the age of the individual, uh, blood type, maybe temperature of the uh, place that the person lives in, maybe the uh, location. So different features about the person, if the person has any uh, history of any, any diseases. Uh, and based on all of these data, they decide whether the person will have a severe uh, COVID-19 or not. Uh, so this is about uh, classification models. Uh, regression models are mainly used to predict the outbreak. I will talk about this in more detail. Uh, for clustering, well, uh, some research, uh, some studies have used clustering uh, to show the to, to classify, for example, different countries uh, in facing the epidemic. So based on the information that they have from different countries, they can uh, put uh, countries in different clusters. Uh, and interestingly, uh, clustering algorithms are also used to, to cluster the studies on uh, COVID-19. So after COVID-19, we, we had a lot of re researchers working in this area. And now because of the number of the research that, that re studies that we have in this area, uh, so we need to use uh, machine learning models to cluster the type of the, uh, the, the type of the studies that we have. And the last one, which I'm going to talk about in, uh, in this presentation, so uh, uh, I've used it in my uh, work, is reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is mainly used to identify the best policies 
when facing COVID-19 or any infectious diseases. Uh, well, I thought that I will talk about this uh, regression a little more. So let's uh, look at the next slide. Uh, so when we have regression models or time series models, uh, they are mainly used uh, compartmental models. So uh, what they want to do is just to predict the number of infect infected individuals, the number of deaths uh, in the future. And uh, they just want to know the rate of the changes and the numbers. So uh, we have a group of individuals. We have uh, we have the population, it is divided to different groups. Um, also, uh, these models are used to estimate different parameters that we have uh, in, when facing an epidemic. For example, estimating the value of beta, the transmission rate of the disease, or estimating the value of uh, R0. Uh, and there are different algorithms used to do that. Uh, examples of random forest algorithms, support vector machine, or recurrent neural network. So different algorithms are, are used. And in most of the studies that I've seen, uh, researchers have used uh, these types of uh, time series models. Okay, so this is at the time that we have a um, homogeneous uh, population. Uh, there are, as I said, there are also some models which use special models or agent-based models. And in these models, again, uh, they try to predict the number of infected cases and the number of deaths. Uh, and what they do is uh, mainly agent-based simulation. So if you are talking about a network, we have different individuals interacting with each other. So we have an agent and in each interaction, which we show using an edge, there is a chance of uh, being infected. And the good thing about these models it, is that different agents, different individuals that we have, they can also have their characteristics with them. So we can have the age, we can have, uh, we can have different, uh, for example, their history of any, any diseases, uh, where they live and different information. So, uh, this information can also affect uh, the dynamic of the epidemics. Uh, well, there is a famous uh, Sony AI's pandemic simulator uh, in which they use an agent-based model similar to that. So we have different agents. They can go to different places. Uh, at each place, there is a chance of meeting someone infected. So there is exactly a simulation. And uh, then in this model, uh, you can uh, you can you have you can have access to to it actually. Uh, you can set different strategies to see what is the change in the number of, for example, dead or the number of infected. How these numbers change, and they have also used a reinforcement learning model uh, to find the best set of policies. So to train a model which can decide about the best set of policies. Uh, okay, so this was a review on the type of the models that we see, but let me start talking about the model uh, that we've worked on uh, and what we've considered and what are the new things about uh, this model. Okay, uh, as I said before, what I'm going to do is use a network. So I'm going to use a special model in which we have different individuals. They interact with each, with each other based on the edges that we have in the network. And let's say that when I have a lattice like this, each individual is interacting with all of the eight individuals around him. Okay, so it is, this is also a kind of network. And what I'm going to do is using game theory to also show the behavior of individuals. So in many of the models that I talked about already, they don't consider the, the change in the behavior of the individuals. Or even when they want to consider uh, vaccinated individuals, they mainly use a rate to show if a person decides to vaccinate or not. Here, we are going to use a game theoretic approach uh, to show the choice of the individuals. OK, uh, this is how the games work. So we have different uh, 
uh, we have several iterations in the game, and this is what happens at each iteration from the start of the pandemic to the to the end. We have a public health policymaker who can decide whether to lock down or not. So this is the decision of a public health policymaker. And after the public health policymaker makes his decision or her decision, make their decision, uh, each individual calculates a payoff. So game theoretic models are mainly work based on the payoff. And the way that they work is that we believe that each rational individual tries to maximize their payoffs. So they want to have the strategy which helps them uh, to maximize their payoffs. So the first thing is to define the payoff of players in that I'm going to talk about it in the next slide. And after each player uh, calculates its payoff, so uh, have an understanding of its payoff, each player can decide to change a strategy. It's a strategy. So if a person is susceptible, that person can decide to vaccinate. Uh, and after that, uh, we have a new infected individual. So the epidemics goes one step forward. And maybe there are some people who may be, become infected. So let's look at what I have here. The public health policymakers can affect this R, which is the rate of contact. So if I have a higher rate of contact, there is a higher probability for infection. If I have a lower rate of con contact, there, there is a lower probability for being infected. OK, let's also talk about the uh, calculating payoff of in each individual. So what I want to do here is I want to have a definition of a payoff of an individual when facing an epidemic. So we believe that people have different payoffs based on the community that they, li they live in and based on their individual decision. So let's say that I define a community for each individual as the people who that uh, that individual interacts with. So if I have someone in the middle, this is the interaction group in the lattice. And let's say that in this group, some people are infected, some recovered, and some vaccinated. So I can calculate a payoff which is related to being a member of a group. So let's think about it. If we are in a group in which we have uh, many infected individuals, so your payoff is not good. You have a very low payoff. But if you are in a group in which all the people are healthy, your payoff is higher. So this is how I define it. I said that the payoff in each group depends on the number of infected individuals in it. And the payoff that I have, you see, I have a negative sign here. So it is in form of a cost. Uh, so I have the cost of infected individuals in the group. I have the cost of vaccinated individuals because vaccination also has a cost. It's not just the monetary value of the vaccination, but the days that you cannot go to work because you are you did vaccinate a day before you don't feel well, or even the possibility of being severely infected, even uh, because of uh, getting getting vaccine. So it also has a cost. I also have the cost of uh, the the cost of uh, the chance of being uh, infected. So the risk of being infected is better to say. And I also have the cost of uh, recovered individuals in the group. And when I calculate the risk of being infected, I talk about, for example, you are in communication with someone who is in a very, who belongs also to a community, which is a very risky community in which many people are infected. There's a very high chance of infection. So this is a risk, this is a cost for you. And uh, this is the formula that I showed you before. This is the probability of, of being infected. So other than the community that you live in, 
your choice can affect uh, the your payoff. So you are, if you are vaccinated, you've also paid the cost of vaccination. If you are infected, you've also paid the cost of infection. And uh, there are a group, they don't do anything. They are not vaccinated. They are not infected. Uh, and they pay the least possible thing and they get the highest payoff in the group. We know this group has free riders. Okay. I talked about uh, calculating the payoff, but let's see how we can uh, update the strategies for each individual. So we believe that individuals look at other people and uh, they try to copy the behavior of the individuals with the highest payoff. So for example, uh, let's say that you know someone in your community who is not vaccinated, that person is not infected, uh, that person even never wear mask. And you may think that, okay, why should I vaccinate? I know someone who hasn't done anything, is healthy. Uh, so you may change your decision not to vaccinate. But you may know a person who lives in a community in which all of them are infected, but that individual had, had decided to vaccinate and the person is healthy. So you may think with yourself that, well, uh, maybe it's a good idea to vaccinate because it prevents you from being infected. So people copy the strategy of the ones who have the higher payoff. So let's say each individual calculates the payoff in a game that we have. And I, we, are, we have also considered um, sensitivity for individuals. So each person looks around uh, in the community that the person lives in and finds the individuals with a higher payoff. So if a person is very sensitive, that person may look at more people with the higher payoff. So go and ask a different person, what did you do? What, what, is, what, what are your thoughts? But if a person is not sensitive, so that may, person may just look at some, someone. Even if, so if a person is very high risk, just that, that person may just look at someone. So I know this as the sensitivity. So let's say that uh, the individual that I have in the middle look at just one person. And because there is a vaccinated individual in the group which, with high payoff, that person decides to vaccinate. Okay, so change is, is the strategy to blue, which shows, which shows vaccination. And then we have new infected individuals in the group. For example, this one may become infected. Okay, so this is how the, games, the game works. And I want to show you the environment. So again, as a reminder, so the purple ones are susceptible individuals. Uh, I have vaccinated individuals as blue, uh, infected individuals as uh, yellow, and recovered individuals as green. And let's say that I have I start with a random population in which I have some infected, some vaccinated, and let's see how the dynamic of the epidemic changes. So you see here, I have some uh, infected groups, infected communities all of them are infected. There are some who decide to vaccinate and we see these communities, uh, no one vaccinated, no one infected. Have you seen people who say that we haven't seen anyone infected? So these, these are belongs to these groups. Oh, one more time. And this is the change in the number of different groups in the simulation that we have. I also want to show you the role of the sensitivity factor in this model. So S is equal to one means that the person is not very sensitive. S is equal to four, it means that the person is more sensitive. So uh, let's uh, compare these two groups. So you see that if people are not sensitive, they don't react to the infectious disease. Uh, we have more, uh, infected individuals. And you see that more people need to vaccinate. But if people are more sensitive, 
we have fewer infected individuals and fewer people need, need to vaccinate. I have also shown it in a very simple model. So let's say that I just have one infected individual and one vaccinated individual. You see that if the sensitivity is low, we have many infected individuals. As I increase the sensitivity, you see there are more people who are per se. Okay. Now I have the environment of my model. Now you may ask, well, what is the best policy? What is the best response? What is the best thing that uh, public health policymakers can do? And this is the time that we can use reinforcement learning. So uh, in, these, in reinforcement learning, as I said before, we have an agent. The agent interacts with the environment and the agent gets some rewards as a result of the interaction with the environment, as a result of its actions. So the goal is to find the set of actions to maximize the cumulative reward. Now let's think about a pandemic. We can have agents as public health decision makers. The action may be having lockdown or not. The environment is the state of the pandemic, the population that we have the uh, ongoing pandemic in it. And the reward, let's say that is the cost of the pandemic that we have. So this is what I have here. I, I de define agents to be the population's policymakers, action to whether to lock down or not. And let's say that when we lock down, so the value of L is one, uh, we decrease the rate of the contact, okay? And I define the reward in this way. I said that the reward of a population depends on the number of vaccinated individuals, the number of infected individuals, the number of recovered individuals, and the number of time that they had lockdown, because lockdown has cost for the populations. And then we model this... Uh, problem in Python, we built the environment using gym environment. And then we use a DQN algorithm using TensorFlow to train this uh, model. And this is what we got. So in the beginning, we have a very high cost, you see. And after some time uh, of training, we can decrease the cost. So the model has learned uh, what, is, what are the best actions. Okay, so this is about one population. Now you may say that in the real world, we, we don't just have one population. We have different communities and populations interacting with each other. And the choice of those populations can affect uh, different groups. For example, if we have an epidemic in China, like COVID-19, the decision that they make whether to lock down or not can affect different countries, different uh, places in the world. Again, I'm using a lattice uh, to show it better because it's easier to understand. And what we're going to do is that we, are con we consider different populations interacting with, with each other. There are several studies in which they've considered uh, the change in the number of individuals in each population using a differential equation. What we are going to use is to use our game theoretic model. And uh, we define our agents again to be public health policymakers. So we don't just have one policymaker, we have several policy policymakers for each community. And if they decide to lock down, we decrease the rate of inter interactions in a group, in a population, also the rate of interactions with other communities. Okay, so they make one decision, it will affect uh, both. There are some studies which considered. Uh, not just one decision, but, but, but two decisions. If have a lockdown uh, in, the, in the community or a lockdown, so not uh, restricting travels with, between different communities, these types of decisions make a problem a little harder and computationally more expensive. So what we have here is just one decision. Well, I know that this slide is a little confusing, so let's look at the things which are important for us. So again, similar to, to the previous game that we had, we believe that 
the payoff of each community, not only that depends on its own payoff, this is what I had before, the number of infect, the number of vaccinated in a community, the number of infected, the number of recovered, and the number of lockdowns, but it also uh, has relation with the payoff of other communities. So if we have a very high risk community, there's a high chance of infection, uh, we are not safe, so there is a cost for us, okay? So I consider the payoff of, for each community to be the summation of these two payoffs. The payoff as a result of uh, the com community commun communicating with other uh, uh, societies and the payoff that we have in our own society. Uh, so this is how I define the reward function for each community. So I have agent, I have my action, and I have my reward function. And for the uh, environment dynamic, I still have the same thing, what I had before, these are all what I had before. The only difference is that when I calculate the risk of infection, I'm not just interacting with people from my community, but there is a risk of infection from other communities in which we need to consider in our model. Okay, so when we build our model, this is a, this is a simulation, so I have uh, let's say I start with some infected communi community, and this is what we see in a lattice, for example, this is based on some random uh, strategies. So you see, there are some communities with who need to do more vaccination, there are some communities with uh, more infected individuals, and there are some communities, uh, hopefully, that they are not uh, infected. So if it we have good strategies here, so we may have uh, these groups. Uh, there's one other thing that we've also considered in our model, and that is using a scale-free networks instead of the lattice that I showed you. Because we believe that in uh, scale-free networks can better show uh, the communications that we have, the interactions that we have in real world. So for example, we have different hubs. Those are with in contact with uh, several nodes, and we have some nodes who are not in contact with many nodes. So, for example, if you consider New York City, uh, New York City is a hub. And these nodes are mainly the nodes which are infected first. So, if you think about uh, United States when we faced uh, COVID 19, one of the very first communities uh, that got infected was New York City. The reason was that New York City is a hub in the United States, also, I believe, in the world. Um, OK, and we also have a model here. So we start with some uh, communities which are infected. And after some time, we see that uh, we have these changes. So we have more infected individuals. They need uh, also more vaccinated in, in vaccination. But there are some communities, you know, they, don't, they are not in contact with many communities who are uh, not infected. Well, this was all about a single population model and uh, multiple communication, multiple uh, societies. And, you know, there are lots of other things that we can do. So in the models that I had, uh, we just used uh, different uh, random parameters, not for a specific disease. And we can use real world data for a specific diseases to predict the uh, behavior. Uh, also in the models that I considered, uh, we've assumed that the network of communication is similar to the network of uh, information. And this is not exactly the case in the real world. So we may not be in contact with uh, someone, with one of our friends, not physically in contact, but the decision of that person may affect our decision. So we may have multi-layer networks. We can consider models other than SIR. There are different models, uh, for example, SIER. Uh, in this model, we didn't have the, the, the death and birth rate. It's possible to add it to the model. Uh, we can consider different time delays in the model, the time from the time that a person is infected until the time that a person 
uh, becomes uh, uh, shows the symptoms, and also there are, we can check several strategies in the model. So, what if if we vaccinate a community, how this will affect uh, the choice of the individuals? And um, well, that's it. Thank you. Uh, and if you have any question, I'd be happy to answer your question. Thank you very much, Marcia. It was a fantastic presentation. I am still trying to get my head around some of the things. Um, so we are opening up now uh, for questions. If anyone has a question, please just unmute yourself if you want, or if you want to pop it in chat, and, and we will read it. Maybe I can start. I was thinking that um, so for me, it's very like counterintuitive that people that are susceptible and not vaccinated have a better payoff because in the long run, they have higher chance of becoming infected and then recover. And then the payoff for those groups is much higher. So how, like, how is it? It doesn't take into account like a longer term perspective or that's that's a really good question. Uh, so uh, let's say that uh, some. So uh, you remember uh, when I talked about? Uh, I believe here. No. <laughs> yeah, here. And I talked about the payoff of an individual. I also talked about the cost of infection in a society. Okay, so if a person is living in a community with a very low chance, so maybe not vaccinating is an option, okay? okay. As long as you live in a very healthy society. The thing is, we are not sure how this value will change in the future, mm -hmm. okay? So for example, if you live with someone who, who is a nurse in a hospital, you have a very high risk here. If your roommate is a nurse, you have, a, for example, a very high risk here, okay? But if you live in a community in which there is a very low chance of infect, infection, so for example, uh, you are interacting just with your family and they don't go anywhere, okay? They are all at home. So there, there is a very low chance so maybe not vaccinating is an option, okay? Mm -hmm. The thing is, this is the decision at one time, and it's not by looking into the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, yeah. Yeah, and the public health policymakers cannot control that decision. The only thing that they can control is whether to lock down or not. But we may have some models in which we can consider what is the best choice for individuals, mm -hmm. what is the best time to vaccinate. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was actually also kind of linked to, to another thing I was thinking, because different countries, for example, with COVID, have like huge different responses from the public in regards, for example, to vaccination. So my question is, can we use machine learning models to know what the countries with higher rates of vaccination did previously to COVID because during COVID, I think most governments kind of scrambled around. But obviously some countries had some previous strategies that worked. So people were more open to vaccination. Can we use machine learning models also to know what strategies were those and to get ready for the next pandemic like before it starts? Okay. Uh, my answer is, uh, well, when, when I talked about uh, clustering different uh, countries based on their characteristics. So one of the things that uh, we may be able to do is to cluster countries based on the characteristics. The strategy that they use can be also a characteristic and we can see if the countries with a strategy, with this strategy, with one which are in, they have one strategy, they also have a lower infection rate. So, or higher vaccination rate. So maybe this can show the relation uh, between, uh, between those things. So the strategy and also the 
result that they got uh, in the as a behavior or the response of individuals. I'm not sure if I answered your question, then, but yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Just a general, a very general question that in terms of um, the limitations and challenges of using machine learning in the field of healthcare, like, like and, and especially that you've come from a background of engineering to uh, artificial intelligence into healthcare. So just sort of what sort of challenges would this method um, have in terms of healthcare? Yeah, well, uh, one of the biggest challenging is to uh, the engineers to under the to, uh, the understanding between different different groups. So to find the common language, uh, that's one of the most challenging parts. But one of the problems with machine learning models is that the model that you have is mainly a uh, black box. You don't know what's happening in it. Okay, you just get a result which makes sense, which which works, and then uh, make sure that you can use this black box, what you what you don't know what's going inside in uh, health systems is a little more challenging to to find out whether this is a really good one. So in uh, industry. It, the chance, the risk of the model not giving you a good uh, a good prediction is much lower than the risk of not getting a good prediction in the uh, health systems. So this is one of the challenging that we have, and uh, that's why we don't see these methods to be applied in real world. So. There are some models, but the models have suggestions. The public health models makers can use the suggestions, but still the decision making is uh, based on what they think is the best. So the system is not automatic. It's not like uh, Facebook, which has uh, some suggestions for you to what to go and buy. So, or when you go to Netflix, what movie to watch. So it's not automatic, okay? Mm -hmm. we, we still have humans making decisions in between. I have another question, uh, Mathias. Which other areas yeah. do you think that are going to be like blooming with machine learning in terms of the healthcare system and health economics? Oh, <laughs> uh, I think these models are getting the word. Like uh, they are applied in different places, and these days you see uh, uh, they have lots of applications. I don't know uh, what are the next, but I've seen the applications of machine learning in different areas. So not just uh, epidemics in healthcare, but many different areas in treatment. Uh, in, for example, cancer treatments, I've seen that they are used to decide uh, decide about the if, if, for example, if a per person uh, had there is a possibility for that person to have 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 cancer and to react faster before they see any symptoms. So yeah, there are many different areas that are used. I I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, what is the next place that we see the applications of these models? But uh, right now, uh, many many people using these methods. So there are there are huge number of applications. Thank you, um, Ishani. Do you want to ask a question, or should I read? Yeah, I was just a little keen on knowing that. Um, um, were there any sort of experiences that you had in your early career that drew you to learning and exploring machine learning and getting involved in this? What, what drew your uh, interest in this? Okay, well, uh, when I started my 
PhD, it, it was like 2016, I started working on uh, modeling epidemics. And I was very interested in this area. I used uh, game theoretic models to model epidemics. And then at that time, I also realized that, well, uh, there are such, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is uh, very useful in different areas and you could see the application. So I was thinking that what we can do in this area, what we can do uh, in controlling the epidemics. Is there anything that we can do? And then when I was working with the data that I had, so I could generate a model, I could uh, model the behavior uh, using the model that I had, but I didn't have any idea that what, what should we do. So uh, it's not efficient to check every possible policy. And then I was looking for what we can do when we have uh, big data and uh, well, uh, this is an, um, this is, you know, machine learning models are, uh, people are using them a lot. And so you may, I thought with myself, can we, can we use it here? Uh, does it have any application? And the answer was yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do we have any more questions? Have any? No, no questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I think with this, we can end this session. Thank you so much again, Dr. Marzia, for your wonderful presentation. You. So precisely explained. Definitely an area I would want to explore in future. <laughs> um, thank thank you. you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank you for uh, thank you to all the attendees for your participation. Just a reminder that uh, at the end of today's symposium, you will be getting an evaluation form. So it would be greatly appreciated if you could fill that out. And uh, yes, we now have an interactive workshop session at 3 p.m. So see you all, all there. Thank you so much, Marzia. It was really interesting. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye. Thank <laughs> you.